So we've been in the, the book of First John, and I want to do a quick review of First John. Um, if you guys can recall, uh, we started out last week in First John. And by the way, there's some notes in here will help you. For a lot of those of you who are visual, um, I, I want you to know that um, we've got a bulletin in your pro, you know, on your seats there. And it goes, gives a little bit of an outline, a purpose, and the three points that uh, we're going to be covering, three major subjects we're going to be covering. If you want to open that up, um, I can share that with you. It looks like Ravi's got it from last week. He's got God is light. You can see that's one section we're going to be hitting on. Next is God is love. And the third is God is life. Now, the primary thing we're going to be looking at um, is really is that, is that we need to travel light. And that has two connotations. One is uh, the light where, where it lights up darkness, but also it's light where it's, it's not heavy to carry. So we as believers should be walking in the light, and we should be walking light. Jesus does not want us carrying some of the burdens that we carry. He wants us to be able to travel light. So that's the name of our series, Travel Light. Now, the four purposes of this letter, one primary purpose is the very, mu- the, the very primary, the, the number one reason why um, John wants, and I want to Im- Im- implore you to know that you're saved. Um, the assurance of salvation is crucial. Because too many people, far too many people, indeed have a relationship with the living God, with the loving God, but they're about 95% sure, and there's this 5% or 10% of the, in their mind that they really just don't measure up. If that describes you today, I want you to know that you can confess your sins because He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all your unrighteousness. You have got to know that if indeed you've had a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to have it taken away. That's a lot of stress, a lot of stress. So the four purposes, quick review, is to make our joy complete. That's a good thing, is it not? Is it great to be joyful, to be content? Perhaps a better word to to put there instead of joy is content. Next is to warn us about the besetting sins that quickly ensnare us. We're going to talk about that today in chapter 2. We're going to go from verses, we're going to re, re-look at verses 1 and 2 and then, and then get up through verse 17. We're going to refute, John refutes false teachers, and we're going to zero in on this term called Gnosticism, a.k.a. Freemasonry. Does anybody get any, anybody's attention? And then the fourth is to assure us of our salvation, which is John chapter, 1 John 5, verse 13. So to surmise it a little more concisely is that John wants to reassure Christians of their faith walk with Jesus and then to counter false teachers. Now, this force, this force principle, of course, is what I really, really, really am going to be saying every single week is that you're sure about your relationship with the Lord. However, if you've not yet come to faith in Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, perhaps today, in the beginning of the message, you might open up your heart and mind to say, I'm going to re-examine the claims of Jesus. He claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. He claimed to be the only way t- to heaven. He claimed to be the narrow road. He talked about the wide road that leads to destruction. So this is Jesus. Jesus makes some incredible claims. For the unbeliever, they're audacious. For the believer, they're life, eternal. So when Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross 2,000 years ago, and he said it was finished, that means it's finished. So when we go to the foot of the cross and ask God to forgive us, ask Jesus to forgive us of all of our sins, and we trust him fully with our lives, we're going to give our time, talents, and treasures. We're going to commit. We're going to admit we're sinners. We're going to believe in Jesus. We're going to commit to living a life that glorifies him, that advances his kingdom. So one more time, if you've not yet surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, I pray today, I implore you today to make Jesus Lord of your life. He'll fill that hole that's in your heart. The question of what's your purpose? Why am I here? Like, God, if you really show yourself to me, I pray that you would open up your heart and mind so that God can and will do that. Can you say amen to that? So... um, Chapter 1, if you recall last week, we zeroed in on perhaps verse 1, and John writes that if you walk in darkness, um, he's really talking about this Gnosticism that had moved into the church. Um, You cannot have fellowship with God. In chapter 1, verse 6 of 1 John, you might want to go there in your Bibles, we're going to pray in a minute, is we see that if we say that we have fellowship with Him, we walk in darkness. 
we lie and do not practice the truth. So um, the Gnostics were saying that you can have fellowship with God regardless of the actions that you live out in your life, and that only the spirit matters, the flesh doesn't matter. And John puts the kibosh on this nonsense when we look at verses 8 through 10. Um, and, and, and if you see that, verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So John just really swings the, the baseball bat. So the point that we made last week, the first point that we made last week, and we're going to reiterate it today, is one is we have to admit that we're sinners. We've got to admit that we're sinners. The Gnostic says it doesn't matter what you do with the physical body, just as long as you're spiritually okay with God, but that's just a lie. That's a heresy. That's a false doctrine. That's what started through the first and second centuries, this thing called Gnosticism. And um, a lot of theologians would say that Gnosticism went away um, in the second or third century, but I'm here to tell you that if you just search just a little bit, and if I, I, I have a logo, I saved it, I'll bring it to you next week, but it's the compass with the G in the center of it, a.k.a. Freemasonry. That G, if you just search really quickly, you see that that word, the G stands for Gnosis. So if you think that Gnosticism went away after the third century, you're not really all that aware of what Freemasonry is all about. Now, if you're a Freemason here today, I'd be glad to talk to you afterwards. You might have a different angle, but I've been familiar with Freemasonry for close to 30 years, so I kind of know all the different denominations, if you will, of Freemasonry, and I'm telling you it's alive because they say that all roads lead to God. Their primary is Christianity, but all other roads lead to God is what they say, but that's a lie. It's not the truth. They're in darkness and we're in the light. Jesus is the only way to heaven. So if you're in Freemasonry, I think you better reconsider your role there because there is an incredible likeness with um, Gnosticism and Freemasonry, and uh, it's not good at all. So I'm going to read a quote by Albert Pike. Has anybody heard of Albert Pike before? He's like the main guy in Freemasonry. So I'm going to read a quote that he says um, in, in, a, in an article that was written. I'm going to blow it up a little bit. It would have been on the screen. It's, he says this, the pentagram, you guys ever heard of that word? The pentagram you see in the East is called the Gnostic schools and in masonry. The blazing star is uh, the sign of intellectual um, omnipotence and autocracy, autocracy. And in the center of the blazing star, Freemason placed the letter G. It signifies gnosis also a.k.a. generation. And the two sacred words of the ancient Kabbalah, have you guys ever heard of that before? That's when you start getting into uh, the Illuminati, Freemasonry, all those spooky words. Everybody said all their, 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 their um, uh, conspiracy theories. If you say that, you got it half right because a conspiracy, he found it. Oh, my goodness. Do we actually get it? We found it? Can you guys say praise the Lord? Hallelujah. All right. God wanted me to talk about this out loud, man. So here we go. So let me read it. In the center of the blazing star, Freemason place, it's letter G. You guys see that G right there? You see me on the back of the vehicles? And then uh, over here as well, this is the all-seeing what? So um, a generation, all, this, another word that's used all the time is generation, and that really zeroes in on what's referred to as DNA. These guys are all aware of this for many, many years um, and all the grand architect, that's also perhaps the G. A lot of will argue that's part of it as well. And then, uh, of course, for the pentagram, whichever we, way we view it presents the letter A. What he's talking about is the, have you guys all seen the Jewish star, the Star of David? Well, I, I think what's been ha what happened was it was hijacked by um, these, these Gnostics. And there is one triangle that's upside down. And the other triangle is upward, so you have six stars. So everywhere you, everywhere you turn it, you're going you're gonna to see the letter A. So that's Gnosticism equals Freemasonry. And I probably offended somebody, but I frankly think that you're lost if you're offended by me talking about Freemasonry in such a um, blunt way. And I, I make no apologies for it. I, I make none whatsoever, no apologies, because it is the truth. Amen. All right, so the false claims refuted by John, we see in uh, verses 1 through 9, and, and, and mainly the, the, the thing that 
that John zeroes in on is if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, basically declare you not guilty and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have to, again, admit that we're sinners. So um, I, I guess we didn't pray yet, but I, I want to pray now. So, but before we do, Ravi, can you confirm that you indeed have got the slides? You made that one. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Ravi. All over it, man. It's all right. It's all good. So um, let's pray, okay? Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and I'm so excited to know that when we open up your word, Lord, you can reveal the truth. You can, you can light the way. You can remove the burdens that we carry because we know you've got this. There's nothing going on in this world we've got to be worried about because you're in charge. You're in control. You're still on the throne. So help us to not be fearful but faithful. Yeah. Father, bless our time together as we hear and listen, and grow, and learn, and be inspired by your word so that we can go out there and share the love of Jesus, so that we can take off those burdens and run free as you'd want us to, in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. All right. So, Robbie, thank you so much. That looked exactly like the one I created. Incredible. So, chapter 2, uh, John starts out with my little children. Are you guys there? Chapter 2 of First John. My little children. He says it nine times in this letter. It's a letter. It's a. It's an endearing term. It's a compassion term. It's a. It's a. I love First John chapter two. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Does anybody need a Bible? Please raise your hand. Did, did we say that? Yeah. I think we already said that. Thank you, Karen. So John is the oldest surviving disciple or apostle at this point in time. It was written. This letter was written between eighty-five and ninety A.D. And then John is probably close to 90 years old. He's, he's uh, by many theologians, thought to be the youngest of all the apostles. And um, he was a fisherman. His brother was James. And he was one of the three in the inner circle. And we know that um, Peter was known as the apostle of faith. Paul was known as the apostle of love. I'm sorry, John was known as the apostle of love. And uh, today we're going to learn a lot about this, this guy named John. Um, so verse 1 says, My little children, that means endearing, these things I write to you um, so that you may not sin or ba basically violate God's laws. Or in the original Greek, it would be um, miss the mark. And if anyone sins, we have or possesses the advocate. Are you guys, can you say amen? amen? With the Father. Who is that advocate? It's Jesus Christ the righteous. So John takes his audience into the courtroom of justice before the judge who is indeed just, and he upholds the law of the land. So the picture John wants us to paint here is that when we are one day standing before the judge, we are in the courtroom, the justice of the last days, and we stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, God the Father. We have to have an advocate that's going to step in and represent us. But we know that there's the prosecuting attorney, a.k.a. Satan, who is indeed the accuser. And the accuser saying, you know what this guy did. You know what this girl did and have all this cra craziness that he presents. And you know what? Satan's right. We're guilty. But what happens is Jesus steps in between God the Father, the judge, and us and says, I paid the price for them. I'm going to pardon them. And the father slams down his gavel and he says, case dismissed and you get to walk free and I get to walk free. Amen. That's what we have in Jesus. Yeah. We're guilty of sin. The unbeliever stands before the living God, God the father, the judge of justice. Yeah. And he's not going to have the advocate come between him. Yeah. He's only going to have the prosecutor and he's guilty. And he'll have to be punished. And the words that that person will hear is, away from me, I never knew you. And that's not a good place to be. And that's a lot of pressure on people. Whoa. But for the believer, once again, your security ought to be 100% knowing that Jesus died for you. He loves you. And on that day, when you take your last breath, you are set free. Amen. You've got to know that. Even though we've broken God's laws, and there's a bunch of them that we've broken. This is what the scriptures say, Romans 3.23. We're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. 
None of us are righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10. For the wages of sin is death, eternal death and physical death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So wait, when Satan makes the accusations, he is indeed right. But when we, when we surrender to Jesus, man, we're set free. Everything is all good, amen? amen. Verse 2 says, and he himself is the propitiation. That's a fancy word for the atoning sacrifice. In other words, it... it, it, it met God's standard of the payment for our sins, for all who trust Jesus, for all who want to receive the pardon, for all who want to hear those words dismissed in the courtroom. It's a beautiful thing. So Jesus is our propitiation. The atoning sacrifice is made on the cross for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole entire world. <laughs> Amen. So when Jesus says to the Father, um, you'll be set free, then you need to know that you indeed are set free. So the question again, have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Are you 50% sure? Are you 40%? Are you 10%? Or you just know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're a sinner not yet saved. And you want to be saved. You want to be rescued. Well, Jesus came on the biggest, best, most important rescue mission this world has ever known 2,000 years ago. And when he was on that cross and said it was finished and took his last breath, that was it. He rose from the dead three days later and he ascended to the Father. That means that he is the advocate in heaven with the Father. And that's the advocate that you need. Amen. Amen. So, the first point is we want to walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. And how do you walk in the light? Well, you be in God's Word. You fellowship. You listen to worship music. You're around brothers and sisters in Christ. You need to be together with other believers, and you also need to spend time alone with the Heavenly Father. Yeah. Next, you want to admit that you're a sinner. Remember Fonzie? Happy days? He said, wrong. He couldn't say wrong. He said, do you remember that? He said, he just couldn't admit that he was wrong. There's too many people in this world that just cannot admit that they're sinners. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to look at the Ten Commandments and the parallel verses that support the Ten Commandments in the New, in the New Testament. So the claim of the Gnostics, um, we want to look at verse 3 now. Um, and the point with this is going to be to obey His commands. It says this, Now by this we know that we know Him by spending time with Him daily, if we keep or do what it says, His commandments um, were focused on obedience, basically. Now, the Gnostics kind of claimed or refuted that, you know, they, they said that um, you can walk with God without really keeping His commandments, but that's not true. So, so John comes in and says, no, those guys are so incredibly wrong. Let me tell you the truth. And he says, he who says, I know Him and yet does not keep His commandments he is, I can hear John say, a liar. J John is probably really jacked up. He's so fired up because he walked with Jesus. He knew him for three plus years, and he knows what he's talking about. So when these Gnostics come in and say Jesus was just this phantom, this hologram, if you will, he's saying baloney. He says, you're a liar, and the truth is not in him. So Jesus ultimately is saying that, we want to have both obedience to God and faith in God. Amen? Yeah. Truth and justice, grace and mercy. So we have to obey Him. Ultimately, our belief much match our behavior. 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. We're going to learn about this. And His commandments are not burdensome. There was a time in my life um, that yeah, this this might make you my, my wife nervous. So yeah. <laughs> it was before I knew my wife. So um, I I got to college. Uh, the skin of my teeth, by the grace of God, I wasn't a believer yet. And I thought it'd be a whole lot more fun partying rather than kind of fulfilling my wrestling scholarship. So the wrestling coach got me in college, <laughs> and that's the only reason I was there because my grades weren't so good. Um, and what I did was I said, you know, drinking is a lot of fun. So uh, I would drink beers. Um, I, I kind of wrote off smoking weed. I didn't like weed. It made me jittery. It was freaky. But with, 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 with alcohol, 
Man, I, I was the coolest cat. I was happy or I was mean, one or the other. So what happened was I had so much fun, but what, what, what ultimately happened was I'd wake up the next day and I'd have, or, or I couldn't sleep and the whole room is spinning. So you got to put one foot on the floor, the other one on the wall. Didn't really help. Throwing up. You wake up the next day, say, I am never going to drink again. And about 5.30 comes around and, hey, where are we going tonight, guys? Dumb. But what happens is, you know, you look back in the rear view uh, mirror of your life and maybe your friend's life and uh, people that are part of uh, your, your high school friends or whatever, and you see some of them still living that way. They're still trying to fill that hole, that God-shaped hole in their hearts with drinking and partying and having fun. And they somehow manage to live life, doesn't mean they're alcoholics, but manage their lives and figuring it out in this surrendered life to really hopelessness because they've given up. And that's what people do. And what, what, what this really, how this really relates to, to, to John is um, th- there really is nothing greater than having a vibrant relationship with the living God. Because the purpose of your life is fulfilled, it's answered. At least you get on that road to figure out where you're going with this life. Because really, the two mandates, the only two that we need to know is to love God and to love others. Jesus said it when he asked him, so what are the greatest commandments of them all? You remember? He said to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, number one, and to love others as we love ourselves. Those two things, that's your purpose, that's your mandate. So we have people that continue to maybe not hear the gospel, and this drinking in college turns into alcoholism, it turns into um, auto accidents that cause manslaughter, it causes jail time, it causes addictions, there's DUI, a DWI, adultery, gambling, getting fired from jobs, relationships with kids wrecked, death, divorce, mayhem in their lives because there's really no direction. The world says that Christians don't want to have fun. Well, what I just read, what I just said, that ain't no fun. You can have that. You can. You can have that. I'm going to stick with playing cards and drinking iced tea, okay? But where those beautiful... And fudge. Where... Thank you, Mom. And just beautiful nuggets, right? Oh. You just distracted me. I'm thinking of fudge now. Does anybody else have that distraction? Like, I am. I'm distracted. Oh, so here's the thing. So I know, and you know this, that when the great joy comes is when you get that phone call from someone And you're a lifeline for them. You are a lifeline for them. Hey, my life is a wreck. Things are going crazy. I don't know what to do. Can we talk? And you walk people off the cliff. You know, they're ready to jump, man. They're just giving up. That is far better than living a life of give me, give me, give me, give me. To the next this, the next that, the next this. Going, 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 going and not taking the time to marinate in their life to trust Jesus is Lord. Being right with God is everything. Amen? So we see the truth. John comes back and he says in verse 5, But whoever keeps his word, basically obeys all of it, truly the love, this is agapeo, which is affection and benevolence. It's it's, It's a word similar to agape, but it's agapeo. Of God is perfected. And um, really that word in the Greek is tetelestai, which really means um, reached its maturity, it's completed, and you've matured really well in your life, not perfected, but you've matured. And by this we know that we are in Him. So we as believers need to obey His commands. Now I said that there's uh, another flyer in your seat, and if you could grab that right now, 
uh, it's the, 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 the top of it says, can all Ten Commandments given in Exodus 20 and other places also be found in the New Testament? If you guys could turn there, I want you to take a look at that um, after you leave today and zero in on it and just see that, you know, Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament Ten Commandments. He didn't abolish them. Perfect example. Did Jesus say, okay, you know, it's okay to murder now? It's one of the Ten Commandments, right? So if you look at, you know, to, are we to worship idols? No. So you go right down the list, and you're going to see all the parallels connected with that. And I, I hope you're blessed by it. I think it's important. So what, what, uh, what, what John's going to say is that we need to love like Jesus loved. We need to love the Lord, and we need to love people. But the Gnostic says we don't have to live or love like Jesus. But John says, he who says he abides or remains in him, this born-again Christian, in verse 6, ought to himself also to walk just as he walked. So there you go. John says, no, you guys are wrong. This is the truth. I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, singularly. John's referring to perhaps the, the Ten Commandments, which you have had from the beginning or the commencement of creation. The old com commandment is the word, the message, and he's probably referring to the five books of the, the Old Testament, first five books of the Old Testament, which you heard from the beginning. Again, or on the other hand, a new commandment. So Jesus brings this new meaning, this new view. Um, in uh, the Old Testament, John's referring to uh, Leviticus 19, 18, and of course, now he's referring to John 13, 34 to 35. Robbie's just zipping them out. Thank you, Robbie. So, then, and then, of course, it says, um, I write to you, which this thing is true, in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And the true light, God's revelation from his word, is already shining. And John is saying this. This was written about 60 years after Jesus ascended into heaven. So a lot of time has passed. A whole lot of stuff has been able to be, get vetted. False prophets have been, you know, um, basically put on notice. And John is saying, look, guys, you're, you're dead, wrong, dead wrong. So next we want to see that, uh, you know, G basically Jesus loved, we're supposed to love like Jesus did. So we don't have to love our Christian family. So the Gnostics say, but in verse 8 it says, he who says he is in the light and has fellowship with Christ and yet hates his brother. Um, the Greek goes back to more detested his brother in Christ. And, and, and mind you, that really is the implication. They're talking about brothers in Christ. It doesn't mean that we're going to hate people uh, like a general principle, but to hate especially brothers in Christ is in darkness until now. So this circular letter that John is sending out, they're receiving it. And he's basically saying, you know, you're all talk and no action. So if you indeed are going to love your brother, you're in the light. But if you hate your brother and you give, give reason to hate your brother, you are not walking with Jesus. In verse 10, he who loves his brother who wants what's best for them abides in the light and there is no cause or occasion for stumbling. And the word stumbling in the Greek goes there, it is called a scandalon, um, kind of like a scandalous um, uh, stumbling, maybe tripped, trip hazard in him. In verse 11, but he who hates or detests his brother in Christ is in spiritual darkness and walks in darkness and does not where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, if you look at the word there for that, uh, you, the, the eyes we're talking about is ophthalmolomos, which is really more definitive, the mind's eye. So it's the brain, with the, and not necessarily the, the physical eyes, but the brain, with the bra what's, what's stuck in someone's brain. So he uses the word darkness three times because he's not happy with the Gnostics. I imagine they were squirming like crazy, and perhaps they were rooted out, but other churches perhaps embraced them, and they rejected John, and you know what happens to them. They just fall away. So John is talking about the Old Commandment versus the New Commandment, and about loving your neighbor. Leviticus 19, 18, this place in the Old Testament says, love your neighbor as yourself, um, which, which is pretty fascinating. Yet when Jesus comes in in John 13, 34, shines a bright light on a different perspective, a higher standard. 
The standard was set, but Jesus takes it another one. says, love one another as I have loved you, not as you love yourself. Because Jesus loves you, Jesus loves me more than we love ourselves. So that's where the, the, the ratchet just gets kicked up. And you say, wow, that's really hard to do. Because people can be really hard to love. I can be hard to love. You can be hard to love sometimes. So love, 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 because some, not only that, but sometimes we have self-destructive tendencies, and we're really not loving ourselves all that well, all that well. So when Jesus knocks, puts that notch up a little bit, you say, whoa, the high watermark got real high, didn't it? But it's a good standard to know and to shoot for. The standard and the pressure comes off of you and I. We're not the standard. Jesus is the standard. Amen? And then Jesus says, they will know you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. Man, we're doing a good job as a church body doing that. Amen? I think when people walk in this, or new visitors, a lot of times they say, wow, these people are loving. And I know sometimes the introverts say, they're too loving. <laughs> like, you know, okay, you can just give me a fist bump. I don't want a hug. Right? I'd rather, I'd rather err on the side of loving and giving you a good old hug than not. But I think that I've learned, and you guys probably have too, it's like, the ones that really don't want to be hugged, they're kind of going to let you know after a while. Okay, let's just give you a high five, fist bump. We'll, we're good with that, right? Remember, John the Apostle of Faith, Peter was the Apostle of Hope, and John here is the Apostle of Love. He mentions this agape love 45 times in this short five-chapter epistle, which is amazing. And if you do a word search for the word love in any concordance, you're going to see his name as the, as the author of those, the word love more than any other, with the exception of the book of Psalms. And we know the book of Psalms has something like 86, I think, um, uh, references to the word love, but there's 150 chapters. So John just talks about love and love and love and love. And he's very protective of the flock. He wants to protect them. But the Gnostics say you don't have to love the Christian family. But verse 9 through 11 says something much different. Verse 9 says, he who says he is in the light. Now, we talked about this last week. John, what John does is this kind of this circular, um, he'll, he'll, he'll start here and he'll, he'll, cir- he'll talk around it and he'll add another circle and come back to the same place. And he'll talk about it again, he'll come back to the same place. So John r- repeats things quite a bit. And you see that if you're paying attention and you underline in your Bible and you circle it. So, so he says it again. He who says he is in the light, walks with Jesus, and yet hates his brother in Christ, is in what? Darkness. darkness. I don't want to be in darkness. I want to love everybody. Even those who treat you, mistreat you and you and me badly. Truth be told, people um, have a hard time reconciling um, disagreements. That one slight look, one slight statement, one stupid thing said, poof, I'm out of here. And the new term these days are ghosting. That's the new term. Ghost them. Delete them on Facebook. Delete them. Block them on the phone. Ignore their text. Ignore their calls. Ghost them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, for those of you who've done that, <laughs> repent. <laughs> Because you're not loving people. So have I arrived? No. So I'm not coming at you from a higher level? No. But I am just helping you revisit your own disposition in Jesus and don't ghost people. Just don't do it. I mean, you, you, not everybody's going to be your buddy. Not everybody's going to be your best friend. Not everybody you're going to call on their birthday. Not every day you're going to be able to call and communicate with people. No, that's not the point. Got to be really careful how we live our lives. Because three years, five years, two years, two weeks, people are going to remind you, hey, I thought you were a Christian. And you're going to say, oh, man, got me. I want to walk like Jesus, don't you? So we strive, we push, we persevere. We're going to fall, but we get back up. We're going to ask for forgiveness. We're going to go to the cross, and he's going to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And we're going to continue living 
for Jesus. Amen? Amen. So we're going to love like Jesus and live like Jesus. Verses 12 through 14, John's going to undress our spiritual maturity. So I'm going to read verses 12 through 14, and uh, we'll dial in on those three things that he's going to really zero in on. So this is what he says in verse 12. I write to you, little children, and we really can assess that this is young, immature believers, because your sins are forgiven you for his sake. And John is saying, listen, newbie Christian, listen, new believer, God can forgive you of your sins. God has forgiven you of your sins. Just continue to come to me and trust me, and you can live freely in Jesus. Verse 13 says, I write to you fathers. Um, that, of course, could apply to mothers as well. And really the ultimate uh, point here he's trying to make is those who are spiritually mature, you have got a different level that you're supposed to live because you have known him who is from the beginning. And then he says, I write to you, young men, those who are growing, young women, those who are growing and developing and maturing their walk with Jesus because you've overcome the wicked one. And then John repeats it all over again. He says, I write to you, little children, young, mature, immature believers, because you have known the Father. And then he puts it in a past tense. Um, to the fathers, I have written to you, past tense fathers, those who are spiritually mature, because you have known him who is from the beginning. And he says it one more time to the young, growing believer. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one, um, the, you know, the evil one, the malicious one, which is Satan. So the next point we want to make is we're not to love the world. Do not love the world. So John dials in on um, verse 15, and he says this, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And you can just put those three words down, pleasures, possessions, and position. But, but you might know or ask this question in verse 15, why can't we love the world? Um, that, that's a good, that's a reasonable question, is it not? Because if we consider John 3, 16, God so loved the world, right? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And we really have to zero in on, so what does this word world, uh, word, world means in this context? Well, there's, there's different meanings in scriptures where God created the world system. God loved the people of the world. However, in our text here, it is indeed, um, John is saying, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. That's what John later, uh, later on follows up and kind of clarifies what he's talking about with the world uh, in 1 John 5.19. I'll read it again. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world, the people of the world, is under the control of the evil one. You notice there's no middle ground here. Either you love God or you love the world. You cannot love both. Jesus makes this clear too. This is turning up the pressure on you and I as believers. But it shouldn't put so much pressure that it blows you out of the water as a believer. You're going to say, okay, God, you shared with me in God's word on how I can, how I should aspire to live my life. We're going to fail. We're going to fall down. We're going to miss the mark. Some of us are different levels of maturity, ones, ones that have been walking with Jesus and developing and growing in their walk with Jesus. Some of you are a new Christian. Some of you have been a Christian for a really long time, but you're still on the milk and you're still really not grown up where you need to be. This is something to aspire to because you're going to fail, but you're going to win too. So Jesus said that if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Jesus said that in Matthew 26, 24. It's impossible to serve two masters. James pretty much writes the same thing in James chapter 4, verse 4. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. So John's command here is the present tense imperative, which means or indicates that not loving the world is to be a way of life for a believer in Christ. We are not to love the world. We can't get too attached to this world we live in. Because we're all going to take our last breath. We don't want to have the regret of not making an impact for Jesus. So let's zero in on these three key points, pleasures, possessions, and position. 
The first one is the lust of the flesh, he talks about which is pleasures, which really is carnality, it's this carnal cravings of the flesh, this unhealthy, ravenous kind of desire to fulfill uh, our physical body's appetites, and it's not just sensual type, it is other types as well, um, you know, bondage to uh, uh, intimacy, um, bounds outside of our marriage, food, clothing, shelter, um, those kind of things really in and of themselves are not sins. However, when they cross the line, and we all know when the line is crossed that um, it's just not good for you and it's just not good for me. We know these kinds of temptations Jesus was familiar with. And th this is what's so awesome about how, how John extracts this from the Gospel of Matthew and reintroduces the same thing that Jesus taught. And remember when Jesus was in the desert for 40 days fasting? because he, he knew his ministry was about to really begin. That was a wilderness temptation. We can refer to that as where Satan comes to Jesus and he tempts him with the lust of his flesh. Even Satan has the audacity to tempt Jesus, God in the flesh, with, and, he, and, and Satan says, hey, hey, look, you know, um, this is a great place to start because Jesus is hungry now. It's 40 days into this fast. And I don't know about you, but three days into a fast is I'm really hungry. So you know, multiply that 40 days in. So Satan knows that Jesus is very hungry and he tempts him and he says turn, to turn these stones into bread because he knew Jesus could do it. But Jesus says, it is written. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So Jesus uses God's word, that offensive weapon, to fight the enemy. Amen? That's what we need to do as well. So that's the lust of the flesh. That's pleasures. That's carnality. If you struggle with things in your life like that, put that, if it's really big, put that on three impossible things where you can have victory in your life. That's how you're going to have victory is you ask God for all the help you need. Next is the lust of the eyes. That has to do with possessions. It also has to do with covetousness. And uh, this has to do with the desire to have everything you set your eyes on. Um, and and, and under, um, advertisers understand this really, really, really well. You turn on the TV and, you know, your favorite car just shows up. And, oh, you know what a new car smells like on the inside. You know how it glides along down the road and the air conditioning works and it doesn't make this noise when you turn the air conditioning on. <laughs> this week I was, this week, uh, this, 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 uh, this is funny. So I've been, dri I've been driving this CRV, right? A little Honda CRV. And um, I, I know I needed tires, but I didn't know how bad I needed tires. So um, my, my car steering wheel starts going dig 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 and like three weeks later, it's going dig a dig dig a dig dig. It's really, it's really, it's really getting bad. It's like, kind of nice, you know, to figure this out. And I said, I'm going to keep trusting God, you know. There's a balance between stupidity and wisdom, <laughs> you know, and trusting God. So I go and make an appointment to replace the two front tires. And I wish I could show you a picture of it, but there's this like massive chunk of tire missing, and you can see you can see the wall. So that explains why my vehicle is wobbling, right? But what happens is, you know, and I know, the enemy, somehow, you'll start noticing on, you know, television ads for cars now. It's like, bam, well, gosh, I deserve a new car. I should have this. Or, you know, the, the, the shoes that you're wearing, you know, they, they, they blow out and you, you don't have the extra, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 bucks to buy a pair of sneakers, and you say, oh, man, bingo, there goes a commercial for it, and you fig figure you want to have it. Or, you know, the list goes on and on and on, but, but we know that the, the cost for a 30-second ad during the Super Bowl is multiple millions. Two million, three million, and this year it'll probably be that much more because they know the audience, and these guys know exactly what they're doing. 30 seconds is not a lot of time to get someone to start thinking about making a decision to either go into somebody's website or making a purchase. Amen? Amen. Christmas time is the worst. They got that bow. I think Lexus does that. Lexus, I'm sorry. The Lexus bow about getting the vehicle out of the driveway. It's like, yeah, make a decision. No, nah, forget about advancing the kingdom of God. I, I deserve this. Amen? And maybe you do, and maybe, maybe you don't, but I know this. This is what James has to say about it. James, the half-brother of Jesus, went, and, and by the way, if you're new here, 
Uh, we've been studying through, we're going to go through the seven general epistles. Um, you know, so, so hopefully you can maybe drop back. And we went through the book of Revelation, and we went through James, and then we went to First and Second Peter. Now we're going to go to First, Second, Third John, and then we're going to hit Jude. So if you want to just really learn the Bible uh, systematically, um, I, I just suggest you even go back and um, study those things online. It'll really help you get anchored in your faith of Jesus. But this is what James says, and we study this in, in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And this is the New Living Translation. It says, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires um, at war within you? You want, covet, what you don't have, so you scheme. And, of course, he goes to this extreme and says, Kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And when you do ask, you don't get it because you, your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. End quote. Now, for those of you who've gotten that new TV or clothes or cars or best foods money can buy, um, they are going to wear out, right? They are. That new car smell is going to go away. There's going to be cleaning to do. So it's not bad in and of itself that God may have blessed you with finances for that. And the point I'm trying to make is make sure that it's not a distraction to keep you from investing in God's kingdom. So another wilderness temptation, Jesus was, the lust of the eyes. Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and offered to give them to Jesus. Do you remember this? Yeah. Could you imagine? Satan was ab actually able to take the big screen TV and show Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Like Jesus somehow would say, wow, isn't that amazing? Jesus was co-creator with God the Father. You've already seen these things. But Jesus once again says this, all this, oh, Satan says, all this I'll give to you if you'll bow down and worship me. Satan is bold, isn't he? But Jesus responded, away with you, Satan, for it is written. There's this offensive weapon. One more time, swinging the bat, whacking him in the head or whatever happened. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 6.13. So Jesus takes his gun out of his holster and he unloads on Satan with God's word. Someone on Facebook this week made a comment that, uh, you know, oh, it figures, you know, you use the word battle in your, uh, you know, in, in, your, in your mission statement and so on and so forth, kind of like you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, at least you're open about it, you know, kind of like the Crusades and the Inquisition. And um, I thought, how can I wisely respond where it's not a dig or a slam? So I said, well, thank you so much for engaging, <laughs> engaging in conflict. But the word battle, we will not remove because it's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. It's nothing to do with physical battle. And we wage war against the enemy. I hope that you're blessed. Have a nice day. Bob. <laughs> That's what I wrote back. I think it was tactful. And it's the truth. We're not waging a physical battle. We're not the Inquisition. We're not the Crusades. I mean, let's face it. How wrong could you possibly get it? To be part of the universal church, a.k.a. Catholic church, and have this massive inquisition to make people bow to Jesus. They got it really wrong in a disgusting, horrible way, just terrible. That's not us. We're going to love people with God's word. So the lust of the eyes, that's possessions, that's covetousness. If that's something you struggle with, write it on one of those impossible things that you can pray about, and God can help you. Amen? So we want to uh, submit to God and resist the devil. So the next one is the pride of life. This is position. And if we have the three C's running along here, this is cockiness. This point John is making address to the man who is boasting or is tempted to boast about what he has or what he has accomplished. Amen? And so the pride essentially consists of two things, boasting about material possession and boasting about accomplishments. So excluding God from our accomplishments for the believer is really, truly looking for trouble. If God has blessed us with material wealth, God has blessed us with an awesome career, and we do not include God with God has blessed me, I'm grateful for him, 
you are, are really on thin ice. Be careful. You can change that. You can begin to glorify God when people ask you, hey, how'd you get this kind of success? You say, you know, I, I, I owe everything to God. He's given me this incredible IQ. He's given me this incredible ability to do good, be good at something. He's given to me. I, gl glory goes to you, Lord. So here's the emphasis here, the pride of life. And Jesus was also tempered in the wilderness. In the wilderness, again, pride of life. Satan challenged Jesus to show off, really, by jumping off the top of the temple. Do you remember that? Satan just said, hey, look, <laughs> do this. Prove how amazing you are, Jesus, uh, by just jumping off the temple. You know the angels are going to come around you, and you're not going to you know, you, you know, hurt your toe on the ground. No, you're not going to get smashed on the ground. And Jesus said, man, Satan, you just keep on throwing them out there. Jesus said, it is written. Can you guys say it is written? It is written. The offensive war weapon comes out of the holster again, and he shoots and says, do not put the Lord your God to the test, quoting Matthew 4, 7. And so God's blessed, uh, blessed you with great possessions. Ultimately, verse 17 reminds us it's not going to last. So we just have to balance our lives, not be so focused on what's going on in this world and preservation of our assets, but perhaps knowing that one day when we stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, how much have you really invested in the eternal? And that's where your bank account's really going to matter. Amen? Amen? You are going to know that God, you know, it's not, you know, the IRS, when they send, they send you the tax return and, and you get your giving statement, all you get all the kind of things in there, and you, you, you tally it all up and, you know, it, you, you, feel, you feel blessed that you gave to the kingdom of God. But, but I don't know what it's going to be like when we finally stand before the living God and God tallies up all these things and it's not just money, it's not just possessions, it's what we've done for the kingdom. Sometimes it's, it's, it's a word that sticks and changes somebody, an encouraging word. So it says this, and the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Can you say forever? Now in 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 11, we, we know that the world is going to, and Revelation also talks about, I think it's Revelation 21, that the world is going to be burned up. Jim Elliott wisely said this, he is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain, that which he cannot lose. The teaching point is the destiny of what, however we live our lives is going to be remembered eternally. We are going to know what was accomplished on, in this life, on this earth, eternally. I want to make an impact for Jesus. Do you want to make an impact for Jesus? So I want to pray for you guys. I'm going to ask God to bless you. Um, and, and I especially want to invite anyone here today that has not yet trusted Jesus as Lord. So I'm going to first pray over you, and I'm going to ask those who don't know Jesus yet or have not surrendered to him. I also am going to ask for those who've fallen far away from the Lord, and they need to come back home. So Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and I am so very grateful that you love us. I'm so very grateful that you care for us and there's compassion on us and that we indeed um, can walk in the light as you are in the light that we can walk without the heavy burdens because you want us walking lightly. Father, I pray that we would travel in a way that just advances your kingdom. I want you to bless this church family of mine, of ours, in a way that is just so powerful and moving and caring and compassionate, inspiring. And I pray you'd cover them with your mercy and grace. I pray for victory over some of the struggles that many are having here today. That, uh, the, the, that, that you, Father, would rebuke the enemy and crush them and, and just smash the works that they're doing so that everyone in here might experience victory, if not today, in the days and weeks and months ahead. So bless them in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. One more prayer, and we're going to have a worship song, is if you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord, I'd like for you to admit that you are a sinner in need of God's grace. You just have to admit it. You just say, hey, Lord, I, I need you. I, I, I want to surrender to you. I need you. I need you in my life. I need to have you fill that purpose that I know it's missing. I need you to care for me and love me and rescue me from a life that is just, just going off the chain.
then you have to want to believe. You really do. You have to say, okay, I, I believe that Jesus indeed died for me. I believe that Jesus is the propitiation. He's the satisfaction. He's the gavel saying, it is finished. It's the gavel saying, you're set free. You're no longer in prison. You don't no longer have to worry about death. And the one death that you really got to be concerned about if you don't know Jesus is eternal death and separation. And then finally, it's commit. How do you commit? Well, next baptism you have, jump into the baptismal waters. It's a public profession of your faith. And then, of course, you can serve. <laughs> you know, oftentimes um, we, we are struggling to find people to help serve. Uh, we figure it out. But there's always gaps in the area of serving. And, of course, perhaps the best way to really feel like you're part of this community is being involved in life groups. So I want to encourage you, even if you were only to come once every other week or so, man, you'd be blessed, and we would be blessed to have you as well. Amen. So, Father, there's someone in the audience today. There's someone in this congregation today. There's someone in this church family today that needs to surrender. And what we're going to ask them to do, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll move in them, that they might say yes by lifting their hand up. So if that's you, would you raise your hand to say yes to Jesus, to say, yes, I will follow you for all of my days. That you're going to believe in Jesus, who he is, and what he did, and why he did it. You're going to trust the Holy Spirit's guiding. Thank you, Father. Just repeat after me, church congregation, dear Lord Jesus, I surrender to you today. All of me. Not part of me. Not most of me but all of me. I want to obey your commands. I want victory in my weaknesses. I want strength where I'm normally weak. All of that's by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I pray that I can seek you, Lord, with a passion and a desire that you're indeed worthy of. Trust you, Jesus, with my whole life. Thank you for dying for me. So that we might have eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day.